Hello, everyone, and welcome back to episode 21 of The Brainstorm. Today, I'm joined by Tasha Keeney, um, and we're going to be going over some bad news for crews, uh, maybe touch on some EV topics, and then we're going to make our way into doing our first ever tech review of a, a pair of Ray-Ban smart glasses uh, that I got my hands on. So, Tasha, let's start with you. Let's talk about the cruise news, and then we can move into the rest of our topics after. Yeah, let's do it. Um, so, so this week or last week, uh, we found out that um, so Cruise Cruise had been having some issues. And for background, Cruise is General Motors' autonomous car unit um, within the company. It's a company they acquired, runs as a standalone unit, but still part of broader GM. Um, so, you know, th that unit had a lot of promise. Like Cruise and Waymo were the two U.S. companies that actually started robo taxi service commercially. No one in the front seat, passengers in the back, paying passengers, um, at least in a couple cities. But um, recently, they've been getting a lot of pushback in California. And specifically, what happened is uh, their autonomous permit in California was revoked. And it was like uh, kind of building over time. But really, what put the nail on the coffin for this was an accident they had. So someone was hit by a human-driven car. They bounced off a cruise car. And the person was actually dragged 20 feet by the cruise car as it tried to pull over to the side of the road. So that's not good, clearly. Um, you know, I do think on average autonomous vehicles will be safer than human driven cars. But um, it's headlines like this that can cause, you know, knee jerk reactions, which I think is what we're seeing um, that lead to unfortunate events. And then after they got that license revoked, at first it seemed like they were just pausing um, operations in California. The surprise at the end of last week was that they're actually pausing operations all over the US. So no robo taxi operations. You have to have someone in the front seat of the car, at least for now. It's, it's a big disappointment. So they are self-enforcing this ban, right? It's not, uh, it's not coming from regulators? So the fact that they're pausing all over the US, yes, is their personal choice. But, okay. you know, my guess is that it's influenced by something that they're hearing from regulators, right? So we, we right. know the California ruling, but uh, I mean, this is just such a setback that you're, I don't know, you're not doing this un unless you feel like you have to for one reason or another. So do you think maybe they saw something in the way that it reacted that they said, okay, we need to really assess this situation. We may have a bug in the code or, you know, something went wrong that could happen again. Or you think they're just being extra precautious given the nature of, you know, the way regulators are viewing this space currently? Yeah. I mean, my guess with the information that I have now would be that it's something that they're hearing from regulators that says, uh, you know, we're not on their good side. Mm -hmm. We really need to get on their good side in order to progress further um, versus something technically wrong. I mean, again, I'm not going to gloss over the fact that someone was dragged 20 feet. That's absolutely horrific. Right. Um, right. In, in general. So, you know, and I've looked at the accident rates across autonomous cars and compared to the national average, it looks like, um, you know, so the national average is like what people report. So Waymo and Cruise both, both adjust their numbers for what people would report because with an autonomous car, like you could touch it and that could be counted as a collision. Um, but so those adjusted numbers, um, Waymo actually looks slightly better than the national average, but Cruise does not. Um, Cruise <laughs> is like, you know, I think it's, you know, an average, an accident. There's roughly half a million miles per accident in the U.S. nationally for Cruise, you know, cut that number in, in more than half roughly. Um, and, uh, the reason I think it looks bad is because one, I, you know, I, I'm sure that there are sort of like collisions, but I, I've, you know, and Cruz says this in, in what they publish as well, that these are, these are lower speed. Um, you know, they're not as significant accidents. The problem with what happened with this one particular person person is that, you know, this looks like a significant accident. Right. right. Um, as, but Generally, like once you're driving below 30 miles per hour, your chances of killing a pedestrian go down dramatically. So that's the promise of autonomous cars, that they can obey the speed limit. Um, you know, they react faster than human drivers. We think they'll be 80 percent safer on average. Um, but, you know, this is a setback for Cruise in particular. And and really, like I'd say Cruise and Waymo, because, you know, Cruise potentially was pushing Waymo to move faster than it otherwise would have. 
um, and now they're halted. So. And then maybe just taking a step back, can you, so you talked about Cruise, you talked about Waymo, where does Tesla fall into all of this? Do you think, you know, this puts Tesla on the hot seat in any way, or is this just entirely separate because they're already running these, uh, you know, networks and Tesla is still, you know, not, or isn't there yet? Great question, Nick. Uh, you got, you got fit to my favorite topic, Tesla. I always want to talk about it. <laughs> It's a top position in so many do of our I. funds. That's why. Yeah. yeah. So do I. <laughs> right. Um, so, so yeah. I, I mean, I think that Cruise and Waymo are kind of paving the path for Tesla because you know they. So Tesla doesn't need the same approvals that these other companies need because they have like street legal cars with the sensors that you know Tesla mm-hmm. says are capable of turning them into fully autonomous cars through software updates. Um, so you don't need, you know, I think when they, when you start taking people out of the front seat, yes, you will need approval then. So they haven't done that yet. Um, but up until then, you know, they can run it as like a a driver assistance, basically like the most advanced driver assistance system on earth. Right. Um, until that point and, um, make a lot of progress along the way, of course, you know, and, and, you know, for background, we always talk about this, but Tesla has a massive data advantage because it has millions of customer cars on the road compared to hundreds at Cruise and Waymo. So a lot more data to train the system. So I, I think that they could probably look at what's happening to Cruise and then know how, you know, one, like to what degree of um, perfectness they need to launch the system, like what do regulators tolerate? But more importantly, If we go back to that data advantage that I mentioned, you can imagine that Tesla can statistically prove that it's safer than humor humans, humors, humans in in a um, a, again, just a a more concrete way because it has so many more miles. Right. If you have like two million miles in the lifetime of your project versus, you know, you're generating two million miles a day in FSD in full self-driving. That's not even the whole Tesla feat. That's just the people using FSD. I mean, that's that's huge. So it's just yeah. again statistically probably going to look better, um, and they have the the opportunity to be not first to market and kind of learn from everyone else, but maybe first to scale. It's interesting to hear you like paint the picture that Cruise and Waymo are kind of pushing forward with regulators, and then Tesla kind of just gets to piggyback off of all of that work. Because I assume there's a lot of conversations. I guess the one risk is you have Cruz and Waymo begin to, you know, mess up in, in the public eye. You have accidents like these con- continuously and then regulators take, you know, uh, more or put in more restrictions that wouldn't, wouldn't be needed if, you know, Tesla was in the mix showing this data advantage, you know, if they have a safer operating system. Um, I guess that would be the one risk. But it is interesting to think about they're kind of pushing the frontier with regulators and then Tesla gets to kind of, it's an advantage for Tesla because they don't have to deal with that as much. Um, Obviously, they're still interfacing with regulators, but not on the, you know, taxi network side. Yes. Um, Apologies, my my dog's next to me and I just had to give her a little bit of peanut butter to to satiate (laughs) her while while we talk. Um, (laughs) So you might hear some rattling next to me, but um, there you go. so this is, this is live. Um, so yeah, it is interesting because historically Tesla has been painted as this black sheep. In other words, people have said, oh, they're putting such dangerous capabilities in the hands of, uh, you know, commercial vehicle owners. So I, I think that, um, I, I don't think it's a good thing, but it, like I think Waymo and Cruz kind of being more aggressive with their expansion plans and particularly Cruz have been super aggressive. Like they keep on, it's city after city that they're announcing. Mm-hmm. And they say that they can launch in a new city in, you know, three months now, a city that they've never operated in before. So that's a pretty big improvement from, you know, it took them years to launch in San Francisco. Yeah. Um, so it is an interesting, slightly tilting of the story that now these other players are, you know, being criticized for safety and safety is important, right? I, I don't, you know, I, are arguably like, yes, we should talk about all of these accidents because they matter. Um, but again, again, I think the bigger picture is that autonomous cars are going to be safer than humans. So I think it's just an unfortunate setback. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, it's not, it's not just Tesla that's, that's being looked at by NHTSA. It's all of these players. Um, I don't expect it to, to, there will be a high level of scrutiny on these systems, um, but are they the right, uh, you know, pathway forward for personal mobility? I, absolutely. I, I have no question. 
Yeah. And speaking of setbacks, maybe do you want to just quickly touch on this other EV news related to to GM here um, and also, you know, related to Tesla? Uh, Maybe just touch on that. And while you do it, I'll, I'll get my glasses set up, ready to go for the next segment. Great. Can't, can't wait. Um, yeah. So the other news that we got is that um, GM is reneg. <laughs> I'm not sure if you hear the peanut butter bowl next oh, to me, but yeah, it's very I, I, exciting. Yeah. The, okay. the peanut butter got, got your dog very excited. <laughs> okay. Right. Uh, she loves to make cameos. Well, um, <laughs> so GM reneged on some of its promises for EVs. Basically, they pulled back some of the, you know, the forecasted numbers that they had to produce electric vehicles. You know, we saw other players like Ford kind of making similar comments. So the story is that, like, people always thought um, traditional automakers are going to crush Tesla because they have so much more scale. They produce so many more vehicles per, per year. Like, sure, they're behind on EVs, but when they get there, they're going to come in strong and it's going to happen way faster than you think. That's not happening. And the reason is because battery architecture is so different than a gas powered car that that's what you need the expertise in, the battery scale um, and the battery pack scale, which is what Tesla, you know, players like BYD um, in China have uh, that the traditional automakers don't have. It's like a totally new Mm -hmm. technology that they're scaling up. So, yes, they're like manufacturing Titans, but they have to totally reconfigure their manufacturing line to make EVs. Um, And the fact of the matter is, is that a lot of these EVs at traditional autos just aren't profitable uh, like they are at Tesla and other players. Um, So so that's the issue that, you know, in today's macro environment, um, you know, you have to satisfy your shareholder base and uh, you might I I don't think it's the right decision to pull back on these investments. um, But I I think that's ultimately what's causing it. Yeah, really interesting. My personal uh, grievance with traditional automaker EVs. This is just purely my own personal opinion. Why do they feel the need to make their electric vehicles look like their electric vehicles? I think people have come accustomed to like the way a BMW looks or the way a Ford F-150 looks, but because they are now EVs, they make them look like they're running on electricity, which to me is just like, just make the traditional BMW Ford F-150. Don't make it look any different than what you know a gas powered one looks like and just sell that i don't know why they have to do this whole ev marketing like just sell the cars that are selling for you and just make them electric because that's what the consumer prefers it's very interesting yeah it's there's there's a couple things that i would comment on there so one um traditional automakers have outsourced so so much of their operations to other pieces of the the supply base but the one thing that they keep in house that they're very proud of is design so I, I think what you <laughs> I think Whoops, just <laughs> took a shot right out there. <laughs> so I, I think Sorry. I think you <laughs> So <laughs> I think what you could be seeing is, you know, they want to show off that design capability. They say, Well, okay, we're late to market, but look at what we can do. And yeah, yeah. I mean it's maybe not satisfying all of consumer taste. And, and the other thing that like to this point that I would say is like we don't think electric vehicles are going to be, you know, it's not it's not the the look, the feel, although, you know, I think the look, the feel of a Tesla is great. I personally have one. I love it. Um, I, I do think it's going to be it's it's the price that ultimately matters. And it's sticker yeah. price. Right. On a total cost yeah. of ownership basis, EVs are cheaper, but the sticker price is what matters. Um, and, and that's what we're seeing talked about most now. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I agree with you. So, yeah. Just you already nailed the design on your previous vehicles. Just turn them electric is, I guess, my point. Um, I hear you. But moving I hear you. on, moving on. Okay. So we've talked about the Meta Ray-Ban glasses before, I believe, in a prior episode. Um, I got my hands on a pair. I went out and purchased them, research purposes only. No, I actually thought they were very cool. Um, I have the pair here. I want to show them off because I think I haven't had a moment with a pair of – or within consumer hardware since maybe my you know first purchase of a smart wor- smartwatch where I was like oh wow this actually has use case you know the phone was I think a big moment obviously for everyone and you can see what the iPhone has done to the industry then it was you know what's next after this we got airpods smartwatch and now it, you know people are searching looking around what's next what is the next computing shift um, on the consumer side And I'm going to take a leap here and say that this is the first time I have felt like, okay, a pair of glasses could work. Um, There is no, this is not, uh, I would say, your traditional AR pair of glasses. There is no augmenting of of a screen. There is no screen. It really just functions as a pair of sunglasses. 
Um, but what is interesting and unique about it is one, you have uh, a camera, um, a very good camera. I'll maybe uh, take a picture or uh, try to put a video in, in the, the YouTube version of this recording. Um, but what is, I think, really unique about these are uh, Meta has embedded Meta AI, which is their Llama 2 powered uh, AI assistant. Um, so if I, I don't want to say, hey, Meta, but I'm going to have to. As I say, hey, Meta, I'm prompting the AI and I can ask it questions. This is all being relayed into the cloud. I assume at some you know, generation of these glasses, you'll have you know, an on-device uh, large language model, which I think would be a very powerful assistant for everyone. Um, but just having you know, played around with these now for a weekend, one, they function great as a pair of sunglasses because they're made by Ray-Ban. Um, and that's been Meta's whole stance. Hey, we're going to... We're going to let the experts in sunglasses make the sunglasses, and we're going to, you know, put in all of the fancy hardware. Um, it's got a great set of uh, speakers, so it functions as, you know, AirPods. I can listen to music, podcasts, whatever. Uh, I can make calls off of it. Um, so there are just general use cases that I think take away from AirPods or, or headphones. Um, but then you have, you know, a camera and then also an AI assistant. So it's not your pure AR pair of glasses. But the functionality of it just layered on to obviously it's just a pair of sunglasses makes me feel like, oh, I'll actually use these more than just a few weeks and then put them in a draw, which I've done with, you know, VR headsets time and time again. And I've actually had uh, I think I had Snapchat's first pair of, of lenses where it felt a bit gimmicky and, and a bit too niche. This feels like, oh, I can actually record video. Um, it's hands free computing to a certain extent. And I just can really feel where this is going. And I feel like Meta has actually kind of nailed this product. So I'm super excited. Yeah, so tell, tell us about the form factor. So yeah, I mean, glasses, like everyone needs sunglasses. There's something right. that we already use, but what do you, you know, we talked about this a little last week. What do you think of like, you know, the potential of Apple to do some, like put a camera in the ear pods? Like how does that match up with this? Yeah, so I think, yeah, so what's interesting is in a future update for these, the um, the meta AI will be multimodal. So it'll actually, and this is going to scare a lot of people that are listening, it'll be able to hear what you're hearing in real time and see what you're seeing in real time. Obviously, you have to have very strict privacy guidelines and meta probably doesn't have the best brand for that. But to your point, Apple does, right? Like Apple has taken a very firm stance on privacy. And I don't know that I'm fully set on glasses being the form factor that everyone uses. I actually think it could be that you have this um, AI powered assistant with you and it's actually ubiquitous across different wearables. So when you do have your you know sunglasses on, it, your, your, your AI assistant is in there. Um, when you have your AirPods in, your AI assistant is also there. So it's kind of just this ambient computing that's taking place in whatever wearable you're wearing today and in, in that moment. And I think that is kind of a future I hadn't really considered. You know, I think everyone was very dead set on there needs to be a screen. It's going to augment what you're looking at. And now as I've been playing around with these, I can see two avenues. One where people still go down that road of we want to augment what you're seeing, but then just a voice based uh, version of some of these wearables where the AI assistant, because they've gotten so good at understanding us being able to actually use a Siri that was smart, you know, that that's a promise I hope Apple can deliver on. Like I want Siri to be able to answer some of the questions I've been asking to Meta in this pair of headsets. And then I think, you know, Apple has a whole new uh, product on their hands. Um, so I think it's going to be a voice-based uh, avenue of you know hardware. And then also people are still going to be able to uh, build for a screen, you know, augmenting a screen. But I think that, that, that future is much further off because of how much additional hardware you have to pack into a pair of, uh, of glasses for that. And these glasses only weigh 48 grams. I've, I've given them to a few people and people have not complained about the weight at all. I, I can't really tell the difference between this and, a, and another pair of glasses. Right. So glasses are kind of like more forgiving of the stuff that you need to put in the frame, et cetera, to actually make this work. And I don't know, it kind of seems like because, you know, Meta has this, um, this 
this AI expertise. That that's another advantage that they have over other com over you know a company like Apple that may be great at making consumer products, um, but just doesn't have the in house AI talent. Yeah, I think uh, in Meta's last earnings call, they noted that Llama Two, which is their oh, it's, this is open source, so any developer can download and and use this and build on it, train it. Um, and, and, and play around with Llama 2. It's been downloaded over 30 million times. And, and that was a, a period of time they gave. So it's been downloaded more than 30 million times, but they were claiming that it is the most widely used uh, large language model out there. And that's not to say that uh, it, it has more users than ChatGPT. It's just that developers are interacting with it more because of the open source nature of Llama 2 versus some of these other ones, which are, uh, you know, wall garden. And it's an interesting thing to say about Meta too, right? Like Meta is known for being in the advertising world, a walled garden. Um, and now they're taking this open source approach in AI, which is, you know, probably another topic for another day, but yeah, just really interesting. And yeah, this is, I think the first time I've been excited about a, a pair of consumer uh, glasses, ever i mean it, it like the hardware itself is just incredible yeah and then i guess meta gets like the data capture you know m with multimodal models yeah like uh video text you you get all those it, or the, in this case like uh audio you you get that advantage from that like do, do you think that they'll sell a meaningful amount of these such that they'll have a real data advantage there or? i i don't I'm I'm curious to see what these what you know the volume of sales are for these because I don't think people I think people have largely just wrote off this category right like people have played around with these devices enough to be like ah not worth it not worth the extra money I have to spend but they're not realizing that this generation of glasses is a step function better than what Meta previously had and what Snapchat has put out there and the the ability to just go out there and capture video i took this i went golfing this weekend i took tons of video hands free i was able to actually swing a golf club while taking a video and i think like just you know encroaching on what gopro used to be for that kind of point of view film i think creators are going to have a blast with these i think there's so many different ways to play around with these for creators and, and and that like, I hope people realize what Meta has put out there, but I don't know, because I haven't heard a lot of, like it, it was hard to find reviews about them. There were only a handful. And then, you know, I kind of just took a shot and said, oh, let me, you know, let me try them. And I've been blown away. Like, I, I hope I'm not overselling them. And, you know, someone listens to this, goes out and buys them. And they're like, no, they sucked. Um, but I've had a great time with them. I like totally see the use case today and then I can see where it's going in the future when you embed more ability through the AI. Just you know, being able to, sp I feel like I'm, you know, uh, in in Marvel. I feel like I'm Tony Stark, like with Jarvis talking in my ear all day. It's 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 pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that that leads me to my next question. But yeah, first I, you know, to your point, I think it's like that's another advantage of having them be like more average looking Ray Ban sunglasses. It's not like, hey, talk to me about this crazy. Google Glass that's on my face and looks so bizarre right. compared to what I would normally wear. Um, but uh, yeah, so what do you use the AI assistant for? So I, I mean, I've been asking it questions ranging from like, can you give me a recipe for uh, like a pasta dish? I've been asking it like when I was golfing, I was like, how what is the average distance a golfer gets with their nine iron? Or, you know, just like those common questions that come up through throughout the day, instead of taking out your phone, asking Siri, getting a response, and just seeing kind of the sources, it just feels a bit more natural to have that conversational flow. And there is also like a context window. So you can ask it a question, come back and, and kind of just follow up with the question. So you get that same feeling you get when you're interacting with ChatGBT, where you, you feel like it understands you to a degree that when you're talking to Siri and Alexa, that's just non-existent right like you you try to use siri and alexa for so many different things and you're like this just is not worth my time like i'll just search it on the web this is i think much better at being able to hold a conversation and so like i'll ask it the temperature outside i'll ask it you know what time it is just kind of those questions i have throughout the day um and then i think kind of that you know again another step function change in how it will be used is once it's multimodal so if it's seeing what i'm seeing 
uh, the example they gave at the demo was you're, you know, in New York City, you're looking at the Empire State Building. Hey, uh, Meta, what is, you know, this building? Can you give me some historical context? Or, um, yeah, I think you could, you'll be able to have in, at some point real time translation. So if we were speaking, you were speaking in a different language to me. In theory, again, not today, but you would have real time translation. So, like, I think there's so many different ways that this can go that really actually excite me and that you know hadn't been the case when i played around with other devices of this nature so it's basically like it's replacing all those times that you'd want to google something and pull out your phone and it's like more integrated you know it's like you're not as rude at a restaurant taking out your phone to stare at it it's on is on your face so it's like well it's on your face that's a, a bit more of a hurdle to actually do that but yeah. it has that added benefit and I think what will be really interesting, and this gets beyond, I think, just the hardware, but once you're able to have your AI assistant, once it becomes a bit more personalized, so it does have like a larger context window, it has kind of lived with you for a while, it understands you. But then imagine having that AI assistant be able to go out and act on your behalf. So if you've been wanting to plan a trip, instead of you know booking a hotel, flights, Ubers, of you know excursions, whatever it is that you want to do, imagine your AI assistant, instead of just what it does today, which is just prompt you, hey, here are some ideas. Here's, you know, it just goes out and actually books all of that for you. Like, I think that is a very real possibility um, and like a very real future we'll be living in and, and not too far. Uh, like, I think that'll happen in the next five years. I'm, I, I'm like very convinced that that would be a, a game changer for most consumers, like just a travel agent in your you know, headset or phone, wherever it may be. I think like, to me, that makes a ton of sense. Personally, maybe because I hate booking <laughs> travel and stuff. But it's like, I think you can imagine like, okay, I'm prompting this, I'm getting answers back. But now imagine I'm prompting it. And it's acting on my behalf. So it's booking that restaurant reservation I want. It's reminding me that, you know, my Uber's two minutes away, and that it, it booked it the night before. I think mm -hmm. th that's where it becomes really interesting as like a true personal assistant living with you every second of you know your waking day. So so then it's Maybe replacing dystopian, multiple but yeah. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, uh well, then it's replacing multiple things. It's like my notes app, the alarms that I set, the reminders that I set. It's sort of like this all in one application. The travel is a very uh, close to heart example for me to um, having a, a virtual travel agent because I tried to use Bard to um, help me book restaurants on a vacation that I went on recently and it hallucinated and I sent the hotel non-existent restaurants and there was a bit of a back and forth about it. So I, I hope that Llama 2 is, is better at that feature because I, I need that. Yeah, there's obviously we're talking about a future that is very idealistic when it comes to AI. And there's a lot of hurdles, I think, to get to where we are, what we're talking about today and where we actually are today. But I think that future is, you know, very exciting. And I can see the different form factors that allow for that type of interaction with AI to happen more seamlessly. Like if I had to take out my phone and hold my phone up like this every time I wanted to do it, to me, that just doesn't feel as natural. It's just we could be having this conversation and I can just go on mute and I can just have that conversation in the same way we're talking with, you know, it's just picking up off the mics that are actually right below the lenses here. So I think it's just, you know, interesting new ways to embed AI into products. I really hadn't considered um, to be, you know, potentially the, the form factors until having played around with these, with these glasses. So pretty exciting times. I think, uh, yeah, if you have the means to, check out this, you know, meta Ray-Ban glasses. I, I think you'll get a lot of use out of them. Um, and if you don't, please don't comment and, and yell at me. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I really like them. <laughs> Nick, Nick can't take the negative feedback. He's too in love with the glasses. Yeah, exactly. I'll just, yeah. <laughs> yeah, just, you know, leave, leave me alone. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, that's, uh, that's all I got. I mean, yeah, hope maybe I'll, I'll try to send, uh, like you, so you can see the actual video that that was the most, I mean, I, I've talked enough about these glasses, but the actual video, the quality of the video is, is just as good as, as my phone, it feels like. So, um, pretty cool. That's amazing. So it's like, it's like the first, like extremely useful wearable since, I don't know, maybe like the Apple watch or something. It's like totally expanding that yeah. category. That's what it feels like. It feels like people that are strapping GoPros to their head and to their chest, like, 
just buy a pair of these glasses. I please like you'll you'll be like, oh, yes, this is way better. I don't know how sweat proof they are. So if you're doing like that, that's where I'm like, they need to make them a little bit more rugged. I don't think they're fully waterproof. But um, for that type of video capture, um, it's pretty stunning. I'll, I'll 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 send a video so that you don't have to take me for my word. You can actually see it. Great. Okay. Can't wait. Yeah. Thanks, Tasha, for coming on. Um, thank you, everyone, for listening. And yeah, again, if you buy these glasses and hate them, don't comment in the YouTube. I I will disagree with you. <laughs> <laughs> Always good to see you, Nick. Yeah, you too. Bye, everyone.